<laughs> okay, so I would like to start by thanking the organizers for organizing this uh, school in this, like maybe the most exciting place for physics, like in these times. Um, I will be talking about Wilson loops in quantum field theories. Um, and I decided to prepare like a very basic set of lectures. Uh, the idea is that this will be pedagogical lectures aimed at PhD students. So I am sorry if some other people get bored or some PhD students get bored too. But I will aim at giving like very basic uh, things, very basics about Wilson loops. Um, please stop me at any time if you don't understand something. So my pace will be such that you sh should be able to absorb all what I will say. So, and you should be able to take notes and everything. So um, that's the idea. So what I will be talking about is about some loop operators that are called Wilson loops in, conformal, in quantum field theories. So the idea is to define an object that depends on a loop. So it's something like that. As opposed to some local object that is some local operator that depends only on a point at the space-time. The first question that we should ask is why do we study such operators? So is the font big enough? So just tell me if you cannot read. Please uh, stop me. So the reason, the main reason, is that these Wilson loops arise in many physical situations, physical situations, and these physical situations, as we will see, include the propagation of particles, propagation of a particle in the presence of a gauge field, some a mu field. Then they are also nice gauge invariant observables, nice gauge invariant observables. And they are good if you want to understand a very physical problem, such as the problem of confinement. So Wilson loops arise in all these questions. Uh, some extra motivation to study Wilson loops are more modern things that, unfortunately, I won't have time to explain. And it's, well, two things I have in mind. One would be the relation to scattering amplitudes. Relation to scattering amplitudes for a very particular theory, n equals 4 super Yang mills, and even planar. Uh, and the second uh, motivation is that in some cases, they can be computed exactly. And actually, there aren't too many quantities in quantum field theories that can be computed exactly. Wilson loops are an example that in some cases can be computed, so you are able to do all sorts of things. And this can be done usually by localization techniques in supersymmetric field theories, and that makes a connection with Marcos Marino's uh, talks. But I won't deal with that. The second question, so why is the first question? The second question regarding Wilson loops is how, meaning how to compute them. And there are basically four different ways to compute Wilson loops. The first way is good old perturbation theory, right? Perturbation theory. Usually, I will cut down words because I write very slowly and also because I don't know English very well, so sometimes I don't know how to end them. Uh, so. And actually, we will cover perturbation theory in these lectures, and you will see how to compute perturbatively some Wilson loops. The second way 
is by using the ADS-CFT duality. This applies to Wilson loops in, uh, in a particular theory, and we will see examples of how to use ADS-CFT duality to compute Wilson loops. Other two uh, ways, well, there are other ways too, but two very interesting ways are like strong coupling computations, strong coupling by putting the theory in a lattice, And I won't be able to, to, to talk about this, but this is pre pretty interesting. And then in supersymmetric theories, you can use localization techniques. And Marcos Mariño uh, will be talking, or uh, already mentioned, something like that. So the plan of the talk will be uh, the following. Today, we will focus in these physical situations. And what I decided, we could have done two things. I could define the Wilson loop for you and then explain you why the Wilson loop is useful to study these physical problems. We will do the opposite. We will focus in a, principal, in a physical situation and we will see how to rediscover the Wilson loop. So we will focus first in the propagation of a particle, in, a, in the presence of a gauge field, and we will see how the Wilson loop arises naturally from that. So today, we will focus in these physical situations, and we will see that this Wilson loop, that there is a natural object that you should study, and this is the Wilson loop. So we will focus in this today. Then, if I have time, I will work out an example. So we will do uh, a computation of Wilson loops. Actually, we will compute the Coulomb potential by using Wilson loops, which is a quite uh, nice computation. And then in lectures three and four, we will uh, deal with the case of Wilson loops in n equals four super Yanni mills. and how to study them with the ADS-CFT duality. So this is in lecture number three. And then in lecture number four, we will focus in a very particular Wilson loop, that is the so-called circular Wilson loop. And we will see how to compute this circular Wilson loop at all values of the coupling. So we will make uh, this computation in the fourth lecture. And the idea of these lectures is that most of you understand most of what I will say. So please stop me at any time if you don't understand something. Um, okay. So any questions at this point? Yes. Good. Is the, is the, am I writing clearly enough and big enough? So the first physical situation that we will try to understand is the propagation of a particle in the presence of a magnetic field, of a gauge field, some mu. You know, um, so let's first focus just in the problem without a gauge field. So you know that the propagation of a particle from x to y, from x to y, is described, so graphically, you have something like this, you have x, y, the particle going from x to y, and this is described by the propagator, g of x, y. Now, this propagator, as you know from quantum field theory courses, is given, you start with your state at x, then you propagate it. So some i, so here I am using some conventions, p square 
plus m squared, this is the propagator, and then you sandwich it with i, y. So this is the usual propagator. What we want, what we are after, is to write this propagator as some sum over path or histories. or path. And later, you will see why. So, this actually, once you have done this, this is the so-called, the word line, word line, or first quantize uh, formalism. And we will follow the path integral derivation for quantum mechanics. So that's what we will do. So first, we, we use a trick, and we write this, jyx, g, sorry, g, g, x, y, as some integral between zero and infinity of dt x, then e to the minus i t, sorry, I, I am sorry about this. So this is, remember, p squared plus m squared, and this is p squared. I just write like that in order to stress that the momentum is an operator, m squared y. We have this. Well, what I have used is just the fact. So I use the trick. I am use, using the fact that 1 over alpha is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus t alpha dt. Right, I just use this, and, and that give, gives me just this for the propagator. Is this clear? It's uh, not very fancy, but okay, it's what we do. The next step is to take this interval between 0 and t. So you have some interval between 0 and t. And then you split it into small pieces of size epsilon. And there are n of them. So that n times epsilon is equal to t. If you do that, then you can write the propagator g of x and y so now basically the idea, the idea is that you divide this exponential, this t, into epsilon times n, and then you write this exponential as the product of n exponentials. It's better to use yellow. Okay. So I'm sorry about that. So this is the integral between 0 and infinity of dt... And then you have x e to the minus i epsilon p squared plus m squared, etc., up to e to the minus i epsilon times t, exactly the same, p squared plus m squared, y. Okay. So, these two things are equal. Is that clear? If I do some mistakes, please tell me. Okay. So, now, what we are going to do is a lot of trivial steps, but, uh, yeah, pedagogical means kind of that. So, it's fine. 
Uh, now we are going to introduce one. We are going to multiply by one between two exponentials. And we write one as the integral over the x of xx. So what we do, we write here dx1, dx2, etc., up to dxn, and then we introduce an identity uh, here. Just let me... So I will occupy the full board. So between the first two exponentials, we introduce x1, x1, like that, etc., etc., etc. Then here you would have, you know, like x2, x2, etc., up to xn minus 1, some exponential of minus i epsilon p squared plus m squared y. Uh, this finish at n minus 1. So this is just dx1, dx2, etc., up to dx minus 1. Can you read this? Okay. So now, let's focus in one of these little pieces here, right? And then, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. I am very, very sorry. Of course not. Yeah. No, I divided T into many pieces, so it's, just, it's exactly the same, but this is sandwiched between X and X1, this between X1 and X2, then x2 and x3, etc., up to the xn minus 1, y. Absolutely. Sorry about that. Now, we focus in one of these little pieces here, and we see that this is equal to xj e to the minus i epsilon. And please tell me if I am writing uh, too small mostly the indices, is hard not to uh, xj plus 1. So we focus in this piece, right? <laughs> and then we introduce another identity, uh, but now you know that 1 is also equal to dp, pp. So this is equal to dpj xj pj and then we have pj e to the minus i epsilon p square plus m square xj plus 1 right now, what we did by introducing all these ones is that now all these things are numbers, are functions. Why is that? So the first sandwich here is just the wave function of a state. So we use the fact that xp is just the wave function of a state with a given momentum in the coordinate representation. So this is just e to the ipx. Right. And here, when this operator P acts on this bra, you just obtain Pj times the bra. Right? So this is nothing but integral of dpj, C can you see if I write here? Yeah, I guess so. e to the minus i epsilon p 
pj squared plus m squared. And then you have xj pj pj xj plus 1. Now here, this is just the product of two exponentials. So this is actually equal to this plus IPJ times XJ minus XJ plus 1. Now, this is very easy to do. This is just a Gaussian integral. Actually, pj runs between minus infinity to infinity. So you perform this Gaussian integral, and what you get is e to the minus i epsilon m squared plus i epsilon over 4. You, you can do it with mathematics even. Xj minus Xj plus 1 over epsilon square. Wow, I feel like a rock star. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so we got this for these little pieces. So I, let me just erase uh, here. Yeah, thank you for this. It is very appreciated. Wow. So do you see better now? You think it's better or not? Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> well, from here it's very nice if you want to sit all here. <laughs> but you think from there it's much worse. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, thank you very much. I never received this treatment, you know. Like. Okay, so shall I go on or? Thank you very, very much. I'm sorry for your time. Can I just borrow my Yeah, yeah. Just borrow the second. Absolutely. Uh, CERN would like to apologize for this technical interruption. Uh, it actually doesn't look too bad if you're a few rows back. Um, so. Uh, can people in the front see at all? Because now the front is... Yeah? So maybe after the break, you might want to <laughs> recess. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. Oh, from here is very good. Huh? Okay. So we have computed each of these little pieces... And we have seen that it's equal to this guy here. Then what we can put this back here, right? And then we see that our propagator is now equal to the integral of dt between 0 and infinity and some, some integral of dx1, dx2, dx3, etc. We call that an integral over path, but with the boundary conditions that x1 should be like very close to x. So 
x0 is equal to x and x at t is equal to y. And then you can see that you put these pieces here. And now when you take epsilon to 0, there is a, a term, so you get the exponential. i, there is a factor of i, and then the integral between 0 and t, dt. Now, you can see that when x is very small, when epsilon is very small, this tends to the derivative, right? So, we have the derivative squared over 4 epsilon, sorry, over 4, <laughs> I jump ahead, and then you have another term that is minus m squared. And this is very cool because you see that we have written the propagator as a sum over path. Is uh, clear? So there is a sum over paths, and each path is weighted by this uh, action. So the picture you should have is like this. So basically, we started with some path. from x to y, right? And time goes from 0 to t. Then we just slice the time derivative like that. So we call it this coordinate x1, this coordinate x2, and so on. Right? Is it clear? Very good. Uh, now, however, you may tell me. So, are there questions at this point? Okay, I don't know if that is good or bad, but uh, for sure it's easy. Uh, one can ask at this point the following question. So, what I did was to divide the path, sorry, the segment from 0 to t in equal pieces. Right? So this piece was, you know, like one millimeter. This was, well, it's in time. So this was like one second. This was one second, etc. So you could have asked what happened if you, like, choose somehow to stretch these segments here and to make these segments uh, a little bigger. In such a way that in the limit, all of them tend to zero, but not in the same uh, rate. So, this is equivalent, actually, to take our epsilon, so what we call epsilon, and rescale it by some metric that is a function of t. Right? This e of t could be, let's say, one half here, and it's two as you get towards the end. So it is clear the meaning of that ET. So it just tells me how larger the segments are or smaller as you move from zero to capital T. Now you could do the same computation as before, you could see in the notes, and that doesn't change the computation very much. But what happens is that we get a factor here, so this is some e of t here, and we also get some factor here multiplying the mass. So this depends on t in general, and e depends on t. So we get this action. So now, uh, okay, so is it clear? Now, you can ask whether one of these choices is better than the other one. The question is, no, not really. So we should integrate over all these choices. And if you have this action, actually, so what we need to do is, given this action, we need to integrate 
over all this matrix, integrate. Over all these uh, ETs, ET like in the movie. <laughs> right? Now you can see that this action, in this action, this field doesn't have dynamical degrees of freedom. In, in other words, E dot T doesn't appear in the action, right? So what we can do is we can integrate out this field by using its equations of motion. So from this action, we deduce some equations of motion for this field that will solve for the field, and then we plug that back in the action. It's, uh, yes, so that's the correct prescription. So if you want to compute the equations of motion, remember, it's just some Euler-Lagrange equations like that, and for the particular case at hand, these equations imply that minus x dot square over 4 is square of t minus m square is equal to 0, and that implies that et, can you see if I write here? People there? Good, thanks. Is i over 2. Again, with Mathematica, you can solve these things. <laughs> <laughs> over. Now, what we do, we plug this back into this uh, propagator, and something nice happens. So, yeah, let me see. So, can I, can I erase here? So I will erase what I have just written. So if you plug back the equations of motion, what we get is that the propagator G of x, y is equal to some integral, well, some dt dx, as before, then you have e to the minus m, and then the integral between 0 and t of dt, then the square root of x dot square. And this should be a known result. So what this is saying, basically, is that the propagator is a sum over paths. So now we don't write it as a single line but we have many lines, like that, and each path is weighted by e to the minus s, where this action is proportional to the length of the path. This is nothing but the length of the path. So, that is what we wanted. A sum over paths, right, with some weight, and what we have found is that this weight is indeed the mass times the, the length of the path. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that, that's a, a very good idea, a, a, a very good question. So if the, if the particle is massless, actually it's better to go back to the original description, and in that original script, to the previous formula, and there you can set the mass to zero. I will not deal with that, and you will see why in, in one hour from now. But if the particle is massless, the, other act, the previous action is better than this one. Okay. Very good. So now, the question is, what happens if we add an electromagnetic, uh, a mu-nu, 
right? So now we want to understand the same problem, the same problem with a mu. So when you have a gauge field, and you have done some com computation without the gauge field, or you have some Lagrangian without a gauge field, and you want to add the gauge field, what change you sh should you do? Do you remember? The change you should do is you take the derivatives, the usual derivatives, right, and change them by covariant derivatives. Right? So you have done your computation. You make this replacement. And I want these lectures to be like sort of useful, so I try to follow all like consistent conventions with factors of i, e, one half, two. I, I may have done mistakes, of course, but uh, I try to. So all the formulas I am writing, I try them to be correct with some conventions. So you know that you should do a change like that. Now this, if you remember from quantum mechanics, that P was like minus E, some derivative, implies that your momentum operator should be shifted to the momentum operator plus E times A mu, where this E is the coupling constant. So later on we will focus in the case of QED, and this will be like the E of QED, etc. Uh, very good. So now, actually, what is the change in the computation we have done? You can, the blackboard would need to be like 10 times bigger, so I have erased that like half an hour ago. But actually, the change that we should do in our previous derivation is the following. So remember, uh, that we took our path and we divided into small pieces and then we focus in, we inserted the identity as integral of dx of the cat times the bra, etc. And we have a piece that was dpj times xj pj before it was pj integral of minus i epsilon and here you had p square but now we have a mu nu so now we have p plus pa square plus m square and this is x j plus 1 So, do you remember this step? We did it without this. Now we will do it with this. Uh, right. So now, the difference, you can actually do exactly the same. Uh, but basically, when this A acts here, it will just give you the, the gauge field at the point xj plus 1. So that is what you get. When P acts here, you get just pj times the bra. So you can do the, again, the Gaussian integration. And what you get is the exponent of i epsilon m square plus i epsilon over 4. So we got this before. So this is exactly as before, xj minus xj plus 1 square what I am saying, sorry, this epsilon comes here and the square is here. And then you get an extra piece that is i e epsilon, sorry, and this e has nothing to do with the previous e of t that I introduced. I am sorry about that. Um, and then you have an a mu at the point xj plus 1, and then here you have xj plus 1 
minus xj over epsilon. So, you can do the computation, and what we get for the little pieces in the path integral, we get this extra contribution. What this means, actually, is that the gauge field, the gauge field, couples to the derivative. To the derivative. And you see, indeed, that in the epsilon going to zero limit, this reproduces the derivative. So, now, uh, and now what I am assuming, so here I will make an assumption, and we will see how to relax that assumption later on. Let's first assume that the gauge field um, so that the theory is abelian, abelian theory, basically what I am saying is that this A mu is just a number. Later on it will be a matrix if you have a non-abelian theory, and we will see how this derivation, what happens with this. So, but if the theory is abelian, you can plug back these pieces into the expression for the path integral, and now what you get is that the propagator from x to y is equal to some integral over dt and, and the path of e to the minus some action that is proportional to the length of the path. This is what we have seen before. And then, in the presence of a gauge field, we get an extra piece in the continuous limit, and this extra piece is e i e times the integral from x to y of a mu x dot mu dt. So, when the particle propagates from x to y, it acquires this phase And this is called a Wilson line. And it's the exponential of this line integral uh, of a mu. Is, uh, are there questions, remarks? Yes, there is a question. Mm. Uh, from this derivation that you sh have shown, uh, you seem to also get an A squared term, a scalar, sort of a correction to the mass. How would you interpret this here? We, we, we will talk about that correction to the mass later on. Mm -hmm. uh, well, from this derivation, you don't have anything, right? You just have what I have written down. Uh, I, I mean, like, when you I mean, do the... This, expanding the square, you also should uh, have write A squared as well. I think, well, when you do the Gauss, Gaussian integral, I got this, but uh, uh, I will check that, yeah. But we will talk about corrections to the mass later on, and, yeah. Uh, okay. So, we got this uh, Wilson line. Now, actually, I would like... Um, so, a question that we can ask is, can we measure this phase, right? So you are told, they say that in quantum mechanics, if you have a wave function, you can define it up to a phase, and you are never able to measure this phase. But actually, this can be measured, and let me spend two minutes in that, because this is like a very physical application, very experimental application, and since we are at CERN, I should talk about physics at some point, I guess. Uh, so there is an effect. That is called the Aharonov of 
bomb effect. And what that is, is you have an experiment where you have a source with, uh, that is a source of electrons, right, some electron, and then you have two slits like that, and then you measure the interference pattern here, interference pattern, right? But here in the middle, you put a solenoid. So here, this is a solenoid. So inside there, B, the magnetic field, is different from zero. Actually, something funny happens because outside the solenoid, B is equal to zero, but still the potential, A mu, you can show that it's different from zero outside the solenoid. Uh, so this, from what we just computed here, we know that the difference of phase, so delta of phase, is equal to IE, the integral of A mu dx mu. So this is a shorthand notation for this line integral of the path above minus, this is a mu, sorry, the same integral of the same quantity for the path below. And this is nothing but IE and the integral of A mu dx mu over the contour, contour, uh, over this contour here. Actually, if you write it like a contour, the signs should be like that. Now you can actually use Stokes theorem, and this is an integral over some surface sigma that spans this contour of B, Ts, and this is equal to the flux through this sigma, that is equal to the flux through the solenoid. So actually, you can measure these things. So this is, you, you know, it cannot get more physical than this. It's a good experimental thing. Questions? Very good. So I have erased something that I needed. Um, so basically, now let's finish this first uh, part by telling what happens when the field is, uh, when the theory is non abelian. Now, if the theory is non-abelian, before we have used the fact that the theory was abelian, and when did we use it? So we use it in doing the following. So we had a piece that is 1 over epsilon e a at x naught dot x naught x dot at 0 times e to the i epsilon e ax1 x dot 1, ta ta ta, up to e to the i epsilon e axn, well, n minus 1, if you start uh, x dot n minus 1. And we have used the fact that if the theory is abelian, these are just numbers, so this is equal to e to the i epsilon a mu dx mu. Or let me be even more explicit, x dot mu dt. 
right? Just because the product of an exponential is the exponential of a sum for numbers. Now, in a non-abelian theory, what does non-abelian non -abelian means? Non-abelian means that A is a matrix. Now, when you take the exponential of a matrix, the big change is that this guy here is a matrix, so it will have some matrix indices, let's say A1, A2. This guy is a matrix, A2, A3, etc. And this is not equal to this for matrices. Simply because you know that for matrices, E to the A times E to the B is not equal to E to the A plus B. Right? So, if each A is a matrix, this is not true. However, people have invented uh, a notation, and what they say, this is actually by definition, so this product is by definition, when you take the epsilon uh, to zero limit, this is by definition the so-called path-ordered exponential of i e to the a mu dx mu. So by definition, the path-ordered exponential tells you to do the following. You take your exponential, you divide it in little pieces, right? You treat each of these little pieces as if it were like a billion, because basically you have the matrix at a given point, and that commutes with itself, but then you should take the limit, and in the limit that reproduces the path order. Now, I don't know if we were supposed to give exercise for the students, but I have one exercise. If you go to Wikipedia and you ask Wikipedia what a path order is, a path order, according, according, to, according to Wikipedia, is the following, and you are used probably to this definition of path order. So the path order of an integral between 0 and t of m of t dt is equal, and now you can do like a Taylor expansion in powers of m, so this starts with 1, or rather the identity matrix, um, plus the integral between 0 and t of m t dt, and no changes here. So the first change appears here. So now this is an integral between dt1 and then an integral uh, on, over dt2, where dt1 goes between 0 and t, but dt2 goes between t1 and t. And that's what is called path ordering. And then you have mt1, mt2. And of course, these are matrices, so you cannot interchange their order. Plus, ta ta ta. So, like one exercise is to prove that this definition of path ordering is equivalent to this one. Very good. If these guys happen to be numbers, then the integration over this contour would be exactly one half of the integration between 0 and t and 0 and t. So with path order, you don't have a half. But that, that is already taken into account uh, by the fact that this, you are integrating over a triangle, basically. Yeah. OK. So now let's finish uh, the first half. Now, sometimes this index starts with a1. Like here, the matrix indices are a1, a2, etc. And at the end, you will have uh, like a n, a n minus 1, a n. So sometimes the trace is taken. So if you take the trace, then you have to contract these two indices. So the usual definition 
for a Wilson loop in a non-abelian theory is the following. So for a non-abelian theory, you have that the Wilson loop, or rather a Wilson line, it doesn't have to be necessarily a loop between x and y, is equal to the trace of the path ordered exponential of i, sometimes I will use g for coupling constant of non-abelian theories, just to differentiate that from QED, from, from an abelian theory, and this is a mu dx mu. Now, just a very small comment. If uh, here you take the trace, and if this is some n by n matrix, this expansion will start with n. Sometimes you are picky and you want your expansion to start with 1, so sometimes you will see that in the definition they divide by the rank of the group. So that is uh, our definition of a Wilson line for a non-abelian gauge theory. And in this lecture, we have rediscovered why it should be exactly like that. So, okay, I think it's a good time for a small break. Uh, do you want to take a quick question, if there are any questions? Or? Yeah, sorry. Yes. Huh. <laughs> okay. When uh, you uh, speak about uh, Aronoff Bohm, well, yes, uh, they are not only the, the upper path but the lower path. No, absolutely, absolutely, the and path actually, going around before. No, no. Ending. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so the difference of path is equal to the phase to the phase above minus the phase of the path below and is equal to, to the integral over all the contour. All the contour. Yes, but the particle could go around a few times around the solenoid yes. before arriving. That's true. So is, can, can one experimentally check these uh, corrections? Yeah, that's a very good upper question. And lower path? I guess, yeah, I guess so. Like the, the correction should be suppressed by the length of the path, right? Yes. So you should yes. have an expansion, and the length of the path should be about the perimeter of the solenoid or something like that. So, well, in principle, yes. But, of course, I am not an expert in this. But, but, yeah, it sounds like you should be able to. Yeah. I believe it's a classic test of quantum mechanics, right? And the the existence of the fact that you need to have the gauge potential and not just the field strength as in the classical electrodynamic. Yeah, and, and that is an important question too. Like, students may wonder why, if B is different, for, if B is zero, how it comes that A has to be different from zero. And the reason, actually, B comes from a potential, right? You, you can write down that. And you know that B is invariant under gauge transformations. So, you know, in a way, that A doesn't have to be zero. A has to be a pure gauge. And actually, for the solenoid, A is a pure gauge, but it's a singular pure gauge. So, that's why the magnetic field uh, can be zero, even if A mu is different from zero. It's a pure gauge. So, it's of the form D mu of something, but it's singular. So, that's why you get a contribution uh, basically, from the origin of the solenoid. There is a lot of problems in physics in which you have these contributions. When you have charges, for instance, and you apply Gauss law or whatever. Okay. Okay, then let's take five minutes.